so welcome to Snowmageddon, everyone. Yeah, no, not really. Maybe if we live to a couple hundred miles further north, that might be a bit of a difference. Uh, how many of you got to see the Winter Lights Festival um, over the weekend? Very cool. Um, particularly out here, it was really neat. Um, de- greatly enjoyed that. So, yeah, and as usual, if we do have school closings later in the week, um, I will record and post um, all these various lectures. Mostly, actually, it's because we've got so much material, and if we skip stuff, um, i.e. not have a lecture, um, we'd have a lot of stuff that we need to catch up with. Um, another thing that I do in my copious free time uh, is to try and keep track of the literature. Um, and one of the things that just came across my literature feed the other day was this. Um, and we talked about error-prone polymerases last time, or translation polymerases, which you know, when there's a problem in the DNA, they will come down and put in whatever nucleotides just so you can get past whatever that gap is. Well, it turns out that, at least according to an article in Nature, I think three days ago, Thursday last week, I think is when it came out, uh, it, that single-stranded DNA um, can be a substrate for error-prone polymerases if cells are in, under conditions of stress. And usually this stress is the presence of very few nucleotides. And so what happens here is you have PCNA, again, our favorite trimeric sliding clamp here. It gets ubiquitinated under stress, and that's a signal for these error-prone polymerases. And these error-prone polymerases then just associate with the sliding clamp. And then this red line here turns out to be pretty mutagenic. So stress conditions just in general can end up giving you problems as far as your genome replication is concerned, even if there's no specific DNA damage per se. So that's what appears that error-prone polymerases are doing. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Oops, click on here. Um, today, I wanted to talk about transposons and then move on and talk about transcription, i.e. going from DNA to RNA, but no discussion of transposons would be appropriate without acknowledging Barbara McClintock, one of the huge heroes in science, and I think what today is Women in STEM Day, something like that. So um, Barbara McClintock, one of actually the very few people to get a single person Nobel Prize um, for her discovery of jumping genes or transposons. Uh, Incredibly well-deserved, took about 30 or 40 years, maybe even longer than that, for people to realize how amazing um, her discovery really was. Um, And the basic take-home message was, everyone thought, oh, genomes were the same. Yes, you could mutagenize them, but generally they were really the same. But no, this is not the case at all. Genomes are incredibly dynamic. And part of that dynamism actually has to do with these transposons. So there are really three major kinds of transposons. DNA-only, retroviral-like, and non-retroviral, retrotransposons. And we'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail as we move along here. But a couple of important ways of being able to differentiate between these. The first of them is for these DNA-only transposons. These have these short inverted repeat sequences at either end of the transposon. Um, These are very common in bacteria, but they were also the very first ones to be found by Barbara McClintock in maize. Retroviral-like retrotransposons, the most interesting, of course, because they're like viruses, probably were actually derived from viruses in the first place. Um, These have direct repeat sequences at either end of the transposons and are dependent on the activity of reverse transcriptase. And again, we'll take a look at these in much more detail later on. These are moving via RNA intermediates. Again, retro should be giving you a bit of an idea. The non-retroviral retrotransposons are actually really fascinating, mostly because our genome is absolutely packed to the gills with these things, and it's not entirely clear why that is the case. Um, They also move around through reverse transcriptases, um, but they don't look that much like viruses. And in fact, people argue, and I will argue on the side they were derived from viruses in the first place. Um, other people will argue that the 
retro trans the um, sorry reverse transcriptase viruses the retroviruses were derived from these retro transposons very much up in the air nobody can really decide exactly how that happens but and we'll talk about how that works as well but probably the big take home message here is there are a whole bunch of these um, that are present in our genome they don't have either direct repeats or inverted repeats at the end of their genomes um, they have these poly T's um, and we'll see what that means in just a second so what I mean by direct and inverted repeats, um, this is something I think the book does a really crummy job of describing. So I made my own super duper figure here. Um, the only thing with direct and inverted repeats is again, talking about five prime to three prime. If you have a direct repeat, it means that you have the same sequence on the same strand. So here, GAA, TGCCA, on the same strand, GAA, T-G-C-C-A-T. So same strand, this is your direct repeat. And we'll see why you have direct repeats a little bit later on. Um, this N in the middle just means this could be any nucleotide. Inverted repeats are just on the opposite strand. So same sequence, G-A-A, T-G-C-C-A. Flip around, opposite strand, G-A-A, T-G-C-C-A. And so this is a way that you can tell that you have a DNA-only transposon, a retrotransposon, and these are very, very useful things to look at in genome sequences because when you're just sequencing on the genome, you don't know necessarily if that was an inserted sequence or not. And it turns out both direct and inverted repeat sequences are really important for binding of DNA binding proteins that we'll get to a little bit later on. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, does it have to be Okay, so sorry if I didn't explain that properly. So N, what the heck does N mean? N is any of the four nucleotides. And so this, in this case, it could be you now GAATT, -A -T -T, it could be GTAC, doesn't matter. And this could also be any length. So a direct repeat is just the same sequence on the same strand. These can literally be, in the case of some of the transposons, we'll see in just a second, thousands of nucleotides apart. And the same thing is true of the inverted repeats. Um, some people also call these indirect repeats rather than inverted repeats. I will try and call them direct and inverted, but again, some people, I will probably also call them indirect repeats at some point. So why should we care about this? Um, well, as I've talked about probably too many times already, um, the amount of protein coding sequence in our genome is 1.5%. When I say protein coding, I mean unique protein coding. <coughs> These retroviral-like elements, these are the retrovirus-like <coughs> retrotransposons, 8%. So we're more viral than we are human. Again, viruses rule. But then the other thing here are these lines and sign elements. Long interspersed nuclear elements and short interspersed nuclear elements. Together, these make up about 35% of our genome. And these are those non-retroviral retrotransposons. Highly repeated. Many of these are literally in tens and in some cases actually even hundreds of thousands of copies that are present in our genome. Quite what they're doing there, where they came from, is still, I think, a very open question. But there are lots and lots of them. And so understanding what's going on there, I think, is a very interesting and still very open question. Um, there are a few DNA-only transposons in our genome, um, these so-called fossils here. Uh, these do not seem to be active. A few of these line and sign elements actually are active. They are jumping around in our genome. And some of the examples of spontaneous genetic diseases actually have to do with the movement of some of these transposons in our genome. Hemophilia is a really good example of that. Um, these DNA-only transposons seem to not be active anymore. So, but even so, <clears throat> excuse me, these DNA-only transposons, um, just by the length of the line, you can tell that there's more of these than there are of these <coughs> over here. So let's look at these DNA-only transposons in particular. They're very well studied in bacteria. These <coughs> have, again, the direct repeat sequences, which are now these, sorry, inverted repeat sequences, these little red, red bars at either end here. And again, that means the sequence here the same as the sequence going back over here. Also encode transposase genes. 
And the transposase is the enzyme which allows this piece of DNA to move around. One of the reasons that we care a whole bunch about them is that many of these transposons in bacteria also have antibiotic resistance genes that are associated with them. And so a lot of the antibiotic resistance that you see in bacterial genomes and a huge problem in terms of antibiotic resistance in bacteria now, hospitals, et cetera, has to do with these transposons and they move around. And in fact, in some cases, which we're not gonna talk about too much detail, they actually move from cell to cell, not just inside one genome, but from one genome to another genome in another cell. One of those ways with plasmids that we talked about really briefly before. So how do these things work? They work through, pardon me, um, what's called a cut and paste mechanism. So what does that mean? It means you have a transposon, and the way you can tell that you have a transposon is it usually has a transposase gene in the middle of it, flanked by these inverted repeat sequences. This transposase is transcribed, translated. Each of these transposases binds to these sequences at the end of the transposon, cuts it out, horrible name again here, the transpososome, nobody actually really uses that, but zome is nucleic acid plus protein. And then this will go and jump somewhere else in the genome and insert itself there. In this process, it generates a double-stranded break. That double-stranded break gets fixed somehow by the mechanisms that we talked about last time. But when this transpososome, again, I just like to think about it as the transposon, which is the transposon plus the transposase, finds a new place to insert itself into a genome, it actually cuts slightly offset. So this will give you an overhang. We talked about overhangs when we talked about restriction and nucleases earlier on. And the fact that you have this overhang means that once you have inserted this transposon, you have a little gap, and that's shown here by these little black lines, because when you cut, again, this had an overhang, whereas the transposon itself has blunt ends. So you're hooking up something with an overhang to blunt ends. So you've got these little spaces, these get filled in, and because this sequence here was, of course, complementary to each other, this is gonna generate a short direct repeat right here. It's direct repeat just by copying that sequence, which was where you had the overhanging end. So the, one of the ways that you can tell that you have a DNA-only transposon that's been inserted into your genome is you have a directly repeated sequence, an inverted repeat sequence, transposase gene, inverted repeat sequence, and directly repeated sequence. So what are these inverted repeat sequences? Again, why do we have them? It's because they're binding to one each of these monomers of the transposase. So they're binding in inverted repeats. That means they're gonna be facing toward each other. And that's what's here in the structure. We have two <clears throat> copies of the transposase monomer here in blue and in yellow, binding to sequence at the end of the transposon, sequence at the end of the transposon, and inverted relative to each other. And so this is the structure which is now going to go and look for a new place to bind to integrate itself into the DNA. And again, this is been very well studied in bacteria to a great extent because it also confers very often antibiotic resistance and antibiotic resistance genes. So those are the DNA only transposons. Yeah? Uh, especially like in bacteria, since they have a smaller genome, is it very variable where they'll find the space to fit back in? Or do they kind of tend to find the same places over there? Okay, so the, the question is, and I'm just I'm trying to record this, although the recording just stopped for reasons that are not clear, so I'll try again. But I've got the backup recording here. Uh, <clears throat> so the <clears throat> does it basically bind randomly and insert randomly, or is it insert at very specific places in the genome? This is sort of paraphrase your question. Um, all of the transposons that we're talking about now insert randomly into the genome, or as far as we can tell, randomly. 
Um, there are a couple of exceptions that we'll get to, and then we'll talk about site-specific transposition, which is another whole different kind of transposition, but functions actually in a very, very similar way and turns out to also be really quite important. So yeah, I'll get back to that in just a second. Okay, so <clears throat> that's our direct, direct repeats, DNA only, transposons. Then we have the retrovirus-like retrotransposons, and the way that our textbook talks about this is really talking about how viruses replicate, but the way that these retrotransposons work is practically identical to it. You just avoid this first step here, which is having an encapsidated form of the virus. Although there are what are called ERVs or endogenous retroviruses. Again, there are a lot of these things that are present in our genome. Um, HERV is a pretty well-known one of these. Occasionally, they do actually seem to form capsids, um, but whether they're infectious or not is, is still kind of an open question. But as far as we're concerned, these are now DNA. They get transcribed into RNA. And then a reverse transcriptase, like we talked about for when we talked about cDNA libraries, will first make a DNA copy of that RNA, then make a double-stranded DNA copy, and then there's a viral integrase protein that actually works a lot like the transposase proteins that we just looked at. It takes DNA, pops it into the genome, and this seems to be pretty random. And when I say pretty random, that's where I, <laughs> the, the exceptions is always is biology. Uh, it seems that a lot of these insertions happen in actively transcribed pieces of DNA, which actually makes perfect sense because if you think about where you have your retrovirus-like retrotransposon bound up with the integrase protein, it needs to find a piece of DNA and integrate it. If that's in really compacted chromatin, it's unlikely it's going to be able to find this place to bind and integrate. So actively transcribed, but not a sequence-specific kind of process. So once you have integrated DNA, which is now your retroviral genome, that can be transcribed. If you're a virus, then you make all kinds of wonderful proteins and make virus particles which go off and reinfect and go through this whole process again. Interested in more details about this? Take my virology course next term. We'll spend a lot of time talking about this process. The, really, there are two central proteins, however, as far as we're concerned, for the retrotransposons. There's the reverse transcriptase, which we've kind of talked about a little bit already, and then the integrase. So what's going on with the reverse transcriptase? Reverse transcriptase is a really amazing enzyme, but it's basically a DNA polymerase. So it takes RNA as a template, but it's a DNA polymerase. And it can actually use RNA as a template, but it can also use DNA as a template. As I mentioned on that last slide, it takes RNA and makes a DNA copy, but it also takes that DNA and make, will make another DNA copy of that. So it can use both of those. So it's a DNA-dependent <coughs> DNA polymerase and an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. There's another thing that these reverse transcriptases can do as well. They have these extra domains that are attached to them which are RNase H domains. So what does RNase H do? It chooses an RNA and an RNA-DNA hybrid. Well, if you're an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, once you've made a copy of that RNA, that RNA gets chopped up by the reverse transcriptase, and now you've got a single strand of DNA, which can be the template for the DNA-dependent DNA polymerase activity of the reverse transcriptase. So. RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, and RNase H activity. Because it's a DNA polymerase, not surprisingly, it has a very similar kind of structure. Everyone remembers the right-hand structure for DNA polymerases? Yes, no, uh, what's he talking about? Um, so this is the structure that you see of all DNA polymerases. Basically, they grab the DNA, and it's right in the middle of that DNA where it's been grabbed, right here, where your active site is. Just like you have with all the DNA polymerases, 
Rare earth transcriptases also need primers. And we're not going to talk about where those primers come from here, but again, take my virology class next term. Really fascinating story about where the primers come from for these reverse transcriptases. So <clears throat> once we've made our double-stranded DNA, it needs to be integrated into the genome. How does that happen? Actually, very similar process to what happens, again, with the transposases. The integrase will cut the viral double-stranded DNA, gives actually a slight overlap at each of the ends here, and then we'll go and bind again. Sequence non-specifically, but usually in some part of the genome where you have active transcription taking place, then these gaps will get filled in. These give you short direct repeated sequence. But what I didn't talk about was that in these reverse transcription and how you actually get that double-stranded DNA, partly because of these weird primers that you have to have, you end up with direct repeated sequences at the end of your retrotransposon. And so as those directly repeated sequences, you'll have a short direct repeat because of offset cutting, again, this black region here that gets filled in, and then a long direct repeat sequence here, also called the long terminal repeat sequence, at either end of your viral DNA. In this viral DNA, it's got a reverse transcriptase and an integrase. So this is how you can tell that you have a piece of DNA, you know, you're just sequencing a genome, and you're sequencing through this genome, you go, oh, hmm, this is weird, I've got this long direct repeat sequence, and something that looks like a reverse transcriptase and an integrase gene, well, that was probably was a retroviral like retrotransposon, and again, that's what like 8% of the human genome actually looks like. So we've got our DNA-only transposons, our retroviral like retrotransposons, what's the other one? The most common one, and unfortunately, the most common one is the one that we know the least about, how it actually works. Sequencing along in a chromosome, you will see a piece of DNA, this red piece right here, which actually does encode a reverse transcriptase, but it doesn't have these direct repeat sequences at either end, and it has a poly A tail. And so this poly A tail actually is kind of a giveaway that this is originally made a lot like a messenger RNA. So there's actually a promoter, you've got a normal transcript, makes a poly A tail, then this encodes a reverse transcriptase endonuclease, but instead of the viral-like process, this guy will bind to that poly A tail and then cut the target DNA and provide a 3 prime OH. That's where the 3 prime OH comes from now for that DNA polymerase activity of the reverse transcriptase. So it actually comes from the place where it's going to be put into. So you don't have an integrase here. You don't have a piece that you make and then bind to it and move it somewhere else. Here it's the RNA itself. The RNA itself together with the reverse transcriptase which will provide the primer to make this DNA copy then there's another DNA copy which is made, puts this into the genome. And this multi-step pathway, um, I've actually looked really hard to try and find a nice example of this multi-step pathway. Uh, I think it's not terribly well understood exactly how that multi-step pathway works. And then you end up with one of these copies of one of these retro elements, non-retroviral like retro elements in the genome. L1 is just an abbreviation for line one. Again, long interspersed nuclear element. This is the most common of those non-retroviral reverse transcriptase-like retrotransposons that you find in our genome. The signs, the S's, that S means the short interspersed nuclear element. These are basically identical, except they're lacking one thing. And that is this gene in the middle here for the reverse transcriptase endonuclease. So what these sign elements seem to be is 
kind of a parasite on these guys. They use the reverse transcriptase endonuclease that was made from these long interspersed nuclear elements to move themselves around. So they have a sequence at the end of their genome with a poly-A tail that caused them to be moved around, but they can't move themselves around. They're dependent on these reverse transcriptases, endonucleases, that you see from any of the long inverse nuclear elements. And interesting thing again, speaking of looking at the literature, last week um, was a nice publication looking at these retrotransposons and their movement inside the genome. So these also, again, are rather similar to the retroviral-like ones. They jump in randomly as far as sequence is concerned in the genome. And where that place happens to be is you know, where there's a little bit of activity, again, a little bit of transcription, but otherwise pretty random. If these retrotransposons were jumping around all the time, what would happen to our genome? Even the little tiny 1.5% it would get trashed. So there's gotta be ways of slowing down the activity of these retrotransposons. So they're not jumping around all the time. And it turns out that there's lots of different mechanisms, and we'll talk about some of them, but one of them was actually just again recently published in Nature where they looked at retrotransposon and a specific way to block retrotransposons actually has to do with the activity of chromatin remodeling complexes. So if you have chromatin remodeling complexes, you block their activity, then you don't have the retrotransposons moving and it seems to cause changes in terms of aging. So maybe jumping of these retrotransposons leads to aging related phenotypes. So, all of our random transposons. Questions, comments, worries? Yes? What are the side effects of suppressing retrotransposons? <laughs> so what are the side effects of suppressing the retrotransposons? So you would think suppressing retrotransposons would be a really good idea, so you don't have stuff jumping around in your genome. That, as far as we can tell, at least directly, most of the time is fine, because most of our retrotransposons are actually silenced almost all of the time. The problem, at least with this experiment, you're silencing actually a chromatin remodeling complex. It turns out you need that chromatin remodeling complex for other things as well. And so it's not a very specific way of dealing with that. Some people are trying to find specific molecules that will block, say, the activity of this reverse transcriptase endonuclease. And that might be a way that you could much more specifically address these. That's probably good for us in the short term in terms of an aging and individuals. On a longer term, the fact that these transposons are jumping around actually leads to evolutionary processes. And so it turns out that some of these genes have been what's called accepted and actually used for important aspects of our own biology. My favorite example of this is actually the protein called syncytion, which is important for placental development. So if we didn't have placental development, none of us would be like the way that we are. Um, and that's all dependent on one of these actually retroviral-like retro, retrotransposons. So evolutionarily speaking, bad idea to block all of them. Maybe for individuals right now, it might be a good idea. Sorry, long-winded answer to your question. But. Okay, but that gives everybody time to get their clickers out, right? So <clears throat> which of the following kinds of transposons are the most common in the human genome? This should be really easy, I hope. Um, DNA-only transposons, retroviral-like retrotransposons, non-retroviral retrotransposons, site-specific transposons. that I count, get this thing to count down. It changes on me all the time. And five. 
I'm hoping this is only because you want to have more time to chat and less time for lecture. So we're not at we're not at 80 percent. So go ahead and tell each other what you voted for and why. Ready? Hey, let's go again. Oops, start. There we go. Isn't that always the answer if you don't know? C in Stedman's questions, right? 90% of his Laker questions are C, 100%. Maybe this is different. Percent yet, but we're getting close. So uh, either it's Monday morning and people are not ready to communicate here, or I'm doing a bad job of explaining things. But yes, it is the non-retroviral like retrotransposons because the retroviral like ones have the integrase that's moving it around a lot like the transposons, and they're way fewer than the lines and the signs. The lines and the signs are the ones that will bind to and use that as their three prime OH. Quest, more questions on this? No? Okay, good. <clears throat> yeah? Uh, so just to be clear, the DNA only transposons, they actually move the entire chunk of code to another location? They will move the entire chunk of code to another location, yes. Just to copy themselves and then get it copied into another location? Okay, so <laughs> the question here, just to have it, have it be hopefully recorded, we shall see, is... Um, these DNA-only transposons, are they just cut and paste, so they pick up a piece and move it somewhere else? And I'm kind of understanding the background question here, is how do you end up with lots of copies of them, if that's the only way they do that? <laughs> or more, the, um, the other, the like line and sign elements, when they integrate, they leave a copy from where they were originally. Right, so the line and sign elements and the retroviral-like ones, because they're going through transcription. So there's an RNA which is made from the DNA. So that original DNA is always still there. Um, they're the DNA-only transposons that we've talked about. There are other ones, of course, that we didn't talk about because it's biology and there are always exceptions. Um, but the ones that here, these are just cut and paste. So they literally, it's one copy. So you have one copy in one place. That's the hole where it was cut out and then it's moved to somewhere else. There are actually replicative DNA transposons that we haven't talked about here. Uh, but yeah, the other thing, but it's, it's good that you point that out, thank you, is because these retroviral-like retrotransposons and the non-retroviral ones, every time they move, they make a copy. And so this does kind of make sense if you think about the vast number that you have in the genome, because every time they move, they've made a copy of themselves, and they've left a copy somewhere else. So it's always being amplified in that process. That's a great lead into the transcription stuff we'll talk about later today. Okay, <clears throat> so I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about site-specific recombination. 
more so because these are really useful tools and because viruses do them too. Um, <clears throat> so this is very different from the transposons we've talked about before. These are now sequence-specific transposons and sequence-specific transposases, recombinases, integrases, all different ways of talking about exactly the same thing. And these also depend on inverted repeats and direct repeats. So that's kind of why I spent the time talking about them. So if you have <clears throat> directly repeated sequences, say in your genome, here, this arrow here, and this arrow here, in the presence of one of these site-specific recombinases, recombination between these two will actually cut out a double-stranded piece of DNA and put these two pieces together. Or, in the opposite reaction, if you have a circular piece of DNA with a directly repeated sequence that's the same as the sequence in the genome, the activity of this site-specific recombinase will insert this into the genome. And this turns out to be really useful. Lots of different viruses do this as well. Another thing that you can do, however, if you've got inverted repeat sequences, otherwise identical to each other, the same enzyme, when it recombines, actually just causes an inversion to take place. So if going this direction, you had an A first and then a B, you have recombination that takes place, now it's B followed by A. And again, it's just this, exactly the same enzyme. It just, if you're acting on directly repeated sequences, it'll be <coughs> integration or excision, depending on which direction it's going. If they're inverted repeat sequences, you end up with an inversion. The best understood, oh, sorry, in the back, yeah. What's the benefit for an inversion? Why should there ever be any kind of inversion? We'll talk about this a little bit later, but the best example that I know of are actually some pathogenic bacteria, which have different kinds of genes that they express on their surface. And if the immune system is dealing with one of them, they invert it, they start to express other stuff. So that's the, the best example. Well, there, are, there are other examples as well, but that's the best understood of those. So insertion, on the other hand, <laughs> is very well known for virus genomes, and particularly the bacterial virus lambda, is what most of the study's been done on. We'll also talk about bacteriophage lambda when we talk about gene regulation, because a lot of what we know about gene regulation comes from the study of bacteriophage lambda. But here, we're talking about recombination. Here, bacteriophage lambda has a sequence in it, shown here in red, and the genome of E. coli has a sequence in it, shown here in blue. These are identical sequences to each other. The lambda integrase protein binds to these sequences and will integrate the viral genome into the host genome. This is you know, identical sequences and sequence-specific binding and rejoining by Otherwise, a protein which is actually very similar in terms of its activity to the transposases that we looked at before. And this happens in the infection process of bacteriophage lambda. So here we have a poor unsuspecting bacteria. Here's the lambda virus, inserts its genome, the little red thing here. That lambda genome will circularize, and we're going to ignore this for the time being over here. Once it's a circle, it's got a sequence on here, which is identical to a sequence in the genome of the host. The lambda integrase gene integrates that genome into the host, and this genome can persist over time as the cell replicates, just copies its genome and the viral genome over all of the generations. Some point there may be an induction event. What happens in an induction event is this integrase gene is turned back on. Now you have a piece of the genome that has a direct repeat on either side of it. This integrase gene will chop out this circular genome. Once you have a circular genome, this is now an active genome which will make a whole bunch more virus. And so this is why you would want to have an insertion, an excision mechanism, of course, this is going to depend on exactly what you have for an induction event and 
how you end up replicating the virus. Take my virology course next term. We'll talk a little more about it. So <clears throat> wanted to spend a little time talking about one other example of homologous recombination that actually happens in a very similar way to what happens with lambda. And these are some very smart researchers who figured out how this can be used using recombinases and directly repeated sequences in order to do genome engineering. And so this is a completely artificial system, but it's a really, really useful way to do gene deletion experiments in particular cells and tissues in an organism at a particular time. So the way that's done is you generate, through the cool recombinant DNA techniques that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, a gene that you want to get rid of that you put directly repeated sequences on either side of. These are called the LOX site. And people also talk about this as a phloxed gene. So phlox with flanking LOX sequences on it. In the presence of the recombinase that will bind to these directly repeated sequences, it will chop this gene out of your genome. But that's only going to happen if you have this recombinase gene. So how do you get the recombinase gene? You have another construct that you made through your recombinant DNA technology that has a promoter which will only turn this gene on in very specific t conditions, specific tissue, specific time and development, etc. So when this recombinase is turned on, this gene will be chopped out. This gene no longer actually has any kind of replication, so this will end up being eliminated. So you've now gotten rid of this gene completely. This is a really neat system because in other tissues, where you don't turn on the Cree recombinase, this gene is going to be perfectly happy. So this is a very useful mechanism. If, say, you figured out through other mechanisms, usually be some kind of knockout mouse where you get rid of the gene immediately and you find that all of the offspring of the mouse that don't have this gene are dead. It's kind of hard to study the death phenotype. So if you care what that gene does, maybe you think it's likely to be active in a different place in the cell. So now, or say in the organism, so now what you can do is you create a phloxed gene and then put in the recombinase so it will be expressed in, say, the liver, the eye, at a particular time in development, etc. So it's another way of using some genetic tricks. And so using what we've learned about site-specific recombination to do some really neat kinds of experiments. And this is also called recombineering because the recombination between these two is giving you this gene deletion process. So that's all I wanted to talk about in terms of transposons. Again, DNA-only transposons. These are particularly important in bacteria and bring a lot of antibiotic resistance. The retroviruses, amazing viruses, of course, in and of them in their own right, but really important is they're the, retro, the reverse transcriptase and the integrase. So they actually kind of see these as sort of a bridge between the DNA-only transposons because they have the integrase, which is a lot like that <clears throat> transposase that you see in the DNA-only transposons, and then the non-retroviral-like retrotransposons that are packing our genome. And then really briefly, we talked about lambda and the Cree recombinases. More questions on these guys? No, I'm not going to ask you the clicker question quite yet. OK, now, transcription. We'll have a couple of slides that are actually identical to the ones we had, I think, in lecture number one, including this one. Um, transcription is going from DNA to RNA, taking double-stranded DNA and making a single-stranded RNA copy from it. This is the done by the, should be actually DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And, of course, our RNA. We'll talk a little bit about bacterial transcriptional initiation, and we're probably not going to get to eukaryotic transcriptional initiation. And the most important, of course, the archaeal transcriptional initiation. Uh, but we'll talk about bacterial transcriptional initiation today. So <clears throat> why do we care about transcription? Lots and lots of different reasons to care about transcription. But <clears throat> one of those is 
when you just look at a genome. And this actually ties in nicely to all those transposons. Remember, you've got all of these line elements, sine elements, retroviral-like reverse trans um, tryptases, retrotransposons, but the actual amount of protein coding sequence is pretty darn small. And so that's basically what's shown here. This is a cartoon of the human X chromosome and a tiny, tiny, tiny little piece of that X chromosome blown up here. Still, the tiny piece is 1.25 million base pairs. All the vertical lines here represent the protein coding sequences. And you'll notice that there's a lot more of the horizontal gray than the vertical dark gray. Um, and these are going to be different kinds of genes. So you'll notice that there are some parts of the genome where there are lots of genes together, other parts where there are very few genes that are together. Unfortunately, this is kind of hard to predict what's where. Um, we do know that protein coding sequences, we know the genetic code, we can predict that there are certain amino acids there, but it turns out it's actually a lot easier to figure out where genes are if you have a different organism, a different related organism. We talked about conservation way back and the question on the exam that I had the wrong answer to. Um, if you find conserved sequences, those are likely to be those that are gonna be important for function and also very likely to be the ones which are gonna be coding for proteins. So here, this line down here, this, the blue stuff represents conservation. And hopefully everywhere you see this little peak where that sticks up, that's where you're also seeing all of these gray lines where you actually have protein coding sequences. These regions, very low conservation, not very much in terms of conservation and very few genes that are actually being made there. Even in these, however, these are actually now different exons. The exons are only part of the RNA which is actually made. You end up making a much longer DNA and chopping out all of the introns. Turns out that figuring out where introns are, and we'll talk much more about splicing this point probably next week. Um, <clears throat> splicing is very hard to predict exactly what's being spliced and what's not being spliced. And that means it's actually really kind of hard to predict just by looking at DNA sequence where the genes are and where they aren't. Conservation gives you some ideas, but it doesn't tell you absolutely what they are. And then we've talked a little bit about non-coding RNAs, but this again is the course that this course could be, just talking about non-coding RNAs, literally tens of thousands, probably more and more of those encoded in our genome. These are incredibly hard to predict what part of the DNA is actually being made into your RNA and being made into proteins. Now, why this is continuing to stop on me, I have no idea. Um, so <clears throat> we'll keep trying. Um, and again, I've got an audio back up here anyway, so we'll have that. <clears throat> so we talk about RNA again. This is the identical picture that I showed you before. Um, difference between RNA and DNA, well, yes, it's R versus D, so ribose versus deoxyribose, includes uracil. Um, they're also in RNA, and I didn't talk too much about this before, lots of non-standard or non-Watson and Crick base pairs. And so you have AU base pairs and GC base pairs, but in some cases you also will have like up here, a GG base pair. So many, many different kinds of base pairing interactions that can happen in RNA sequences. And as we look later on, particularly talking about ribosomal RNA and tRNAs, turns out there are lots of modifications that happen to the bases and the riboses themselves. And again, my favorite here, single-stranded. No, it's not single-stranded. Most RNAs look like this. Uh, most of the bases are actually paired with each other most of the time. So I like to think about this again much more as a single molecule than versus single stranded. Base pairing, you do have Watson and Crick base pairs, uracil instead of thymidine, and adenine, cytosine, base pairing with guanine, but many other ones um, as well, less frequent than Watson and Crick, but certainly you have some of them. Again, difference, ribose versus deoxyribose at the two prime position. Remember, this is one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime. 
looking at the carbons. And uracil is <clears throat> just like thymine, but it's missing this methyl group. So what kinds of RNAs do you have inside your cells? The vast majority of the RNA inside the cell is going to be, so this is flipped around. Sorry, I got these wrong. So ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNAs are the most common RNAs that you have inside the cell. That's partly because all the ribosome is RNA. And when we talk about translation, we'll spend a little bit, quite a while talking about the fact that the ribosome is RNA. And actually, you can have ribosomal activity in the absence of proteins completely. So ribosomal RNA is the most common RNA that you see inside the cell. Transfer RNAs, which are what's you know, moving each of those individual amino acids into the ribosome. Also, these are stable RNAs. So you need lots of both of these RNAs. And these numbers, sorry, here should be switched. So about 80% of the RNA inside of our cell is ribosomal RNA. And 3 to 5% of the RNA inside our cell is a <clears throat> tRNA. Messenger RNAs is what we usually talk about. They're actually present at much, much, much lower concentrations. Messenger RNAs are usually not very stable. And so they're made, they get translated, they get degraded, and you move on. There are lots of other kinds of RNAs inside the cell. Small nuclear RNAs, mostly important for splicing, and we'll talk more about splicing later on. Small nucleolar RNAs, snow RNAs. They're important for modifications, particularly of ribosomal RNAs, but it turns out other RNAs as well. These next four are regulatory RNAs, microRNAs, small interfering RNAs, PV interacting RNAs, and long non-coding RNAs. It's particularly these long non-coding RNAs. These are the ones which are very, very hard to predict what's actually making them, what's coding for these sequences inside of the cell. Turns out that they're really important for regulatory processes, as are microarrays and small interfering RNAs. I wanted to mention the piRNAs again really briefly here. You were asked about before, what about suppressing transposable elements? Turns out that these piRNAs are very important blocking the activity of transposable elements. So it's a small RNA which is important for blocking the activity of these retrotransposons from jumping around inside the genome. So um, why these RNAs? They've got activities. They're regulatory. But you can also use them for coding sequences. And this gets back to your question about the DNA-only transposons and the you know, retrotransposons where you're making copies. So one of the really nice things about RNA is Unlike DNA, where you've got you know, one copy of DNA or two copies of DNA, that'll go to four copies of DNA, that'll go to eight copies of DNA, but only in any given replication process. For transcription, since you're just copying a small part of your genome, there's ways, regulatory ways, that we'll talk about a lot more later on, where you can make large amounts of RNA copies, many, many, many RNA copies from one particular gene, and a lot more copies of one gene than another gene. And just because you have more copies of the RNA means you're going to have more copies of the protein. This process here, translation, is also regulated. So you can have large amounts of RNA and small amounts of protein, et cetera, or small amounts of RNA and large amounts of protein. But in general, it's the level of transcription, the amount of an RNA from a particular gene, part of the DNA, which is copied into RNA, which will determine how much of that particular part of the genome is you know, being transcribed and actually then eventually being made into protein, or for that matter, into some kind of active RNA. So if you think about the RNAs that you have large quantities of inside the cell, those are going to be what is actually being made with the highest frequency. So that brings me to another clicker question. So which of the following is a correct statement regarding the amount of mRNA in most cells? There's more mRNA in the cell than tRNA or RNA. There's more mRNA than T, but less than R. It's about the same of M and R, about the same as M and T, less mRNA than either ribosomal RNA or tRNA.
Aiming for 100%. Let's get 100. <clears throat> 10, 5, 3, 2, 1. Above 80%, we can stop now. <laughs> no more reasons for discussions. So. <laughs> oh, we stop. Oh, I didn't stop you. Oh, no. How did I? 100% go. Go. OK, who's, who's that last one with C? Make sure your clicker works. Let's see if I screw this up. No. no, D. Come on, let's get an E. There we go. Thank you. Stop. Yay. Woohoo. See, it goes to show if I go messing up here. It must be Monday morning for me as well. OK, so everybody's going to get a point for that one. How good. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> what does this job? Oh, let's get rid of this. Um, it's the RNA polymerase. And I will almost always talk about RNA polymerase, particularly in this class. Um, again, I should be calling this the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, because there are actually RNA-dependent RNA polymerases which are really important for viruses, but not very many in cells. So the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase will make the complement of one of the DNA strands. And so this is an important concept to think about. This is what's called the template strand. So the template strand, this is being used as the template that the RNA polymerase will transcribe from. So here at the bottom, you'll have you know, purine, pyrimidine, purine, purine. Then you're going to have pyrimidine, purine, pyrimidine, pyrimidine, because it's going to be the, the copy of the non-template strand. So the template strand, that's what gets copied. And so the non-template strand is going to be the same as the RNA, which is being made, of course, with uracil instead of thymidine and ribose instead of the deoxyribose. So that's one of the things. The other really important aspect about RNA polymerases, and this is, you know, we kind of talked about this already, DNA polymerases have a big problem. They always need a primer. RNA polymerases don't. And so that's the big difference. At least DNA-dependent RNA polymerases don't. So they don't need a primer. They can start anywhere, which is great because it means that you can start anywhere, but you have to figure out where to start. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, we already talked about the case of DNA primase, which is a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, has lower fidelity than DNA polymerases, so makes more mistakes. Well, it turns out that these mistakes are not as critical because the RNA is not being transferred genetically. It's not being inherited, so not as much of a problem. There's a small amount of proofreading that takes place, and the proofreading again. So just like we have in DNA polymerases, you're always going from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. There's a small amount of 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease activity. And the RNA which is made, again, the quote-unquote single-stranded RNA, actually is released from the RNA polymerase pretty quickly. So there's only about five or ten nucleotides at most where this DNA-dependent RNA polymerase actually is bound to the RNA and that the RNA-DNA is a hybrid. And in the process of doing this, you're pulling the two strands apart because you've got to pull the two strands apart so that you can be transcribing this DNA. But as soon as this RNA comes off, the DNA becomes double-stranded again. So let's look at an overview of this whole process um, here for, this is for bacterial transcription, but it turns out that eukaryotic transcription has very, very similar processes, um, just a lot more proteins are involved in this whole process. So the important aspect here, probably the most important, is what's called the promoter sequence. Now promoter sequence is that's where the RNA polymerase knows where to start. So you can kind of think of this like the origin for replication. It's going to be where the RNA polymerase is going to bind to the DNA and start. And it doesn't need a primer. So this binding process is very, very important. And in the case of bacteria, there's a 
extra protein, again, we've talked about this before, called the factor. Why the molecular biologists call proteins factors, I don't know. But the sigma factor binds to the DNA, the RNA, DNA dependent RNA polymerase and allows you to get specific binding to the promoter. So this sigma factor is actually a specificity factor. This allows the RNA to polymerase to find the right promoter. Once it gets to the right promoter, then it forms what's called a closed complex. So what the heck is a closed complex? Closed and open complexes here are just the DNA strands. So when the two DNA strands are together, that's a closed complex. The two DNA strands come apart, it's an open complex. So have the closed complex that forms open complex. What has to happen with an open complex? You need to pull the two strands apart. What's that called? What's the activity to do that called? Helicase activity. So RNA polymerases have a DNA helicase activity because they're pulling those two strands apart. Once they've pulled the two strands apart, the RNA polymerase can actually start to make short RNAs. One of the things that I didn't mention before is that these are low fidelity, i.e. they make a bunch of mistakes, but they're incredibly high processivity. Once the RNA polymerase gets started, it stays on the DNA all the way to the end. There's no extra sliding clamp to hold it on. So RNA polymerases, once they're on the DNA, they will stay on the DNA until they get to the very end of the gene. And what that means is, is that the RNA polymerase wants to be really sure, to totally over-anthropomorphize here, that it's doing what it wants to do. And so what happens at almost all promoters is there's something called abortive initiation, where a short piece of RNA is made, and then it gets kicked out, and the RNA polymerase starts again, short piece of DNA, gets kicked out, etc. And this basically just seems to be a control mechanism. Since you are so processive, once you start cruising along and polymerizing your RNA, each one of those individual nucleotides you add is a nucleotide triphosphate. So it's going to be very energetically expensive to make a really long RNA. So you want to be very sure that you want to make that long RNA. So abortive initiation is a short way to just kick out these individual short pieces of, D of RNA until the polymerase decides, again to oto-anthropomorphize, that this is going to be now a gene it wants to completely transcribe. It kicks off the sigma factor and then will processively transcribe the whole gene until it gets to a termination point, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Then the whole complex falls apart, the DNA is released, the RNA is released, the polymerase is released, binds to a sigma factor, and starts again. So we'll talk about particularly each of these individual steps in our next lecture. See you on Wednesday.